This is Twit. Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. Provide more support for MSP teams by keeping their skills up to date in all aspects of IT, including MS Cloud, AWS, CompTIA, and so much more. Twitter listeners will receive at least 20% off or as much as 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution Plan. The discount is based on the size of your team when you fill out their form. The general concept that I'm talking about is called out-of-band management, or UBI, O-O-B-I. Um, it's been around a very, very long time. Um, I first got introduced to out-of-band management uh, with the federal government. Um, in that case, it was being used so that we could have our taps and filters so we can go and monitor anything that exits or crosses through the network in classified installations. My second big introduction was actually as part of the InteropNet team back in the mid 80s. They actually ran a thing called Access Ether. Um, it was a physically separate network. And in those days, we were starting to transition to uh, faster and faster speeds. And we we're getting away from the old 62 and a half micron uh, multimode fiber. So we had a lot of 62 and a half micron fiber that weren't being used as part of the interrupt net as everything shifted over to the single mode world. Well, the cool thing about this was we were able to run a fairly large uh, flat network, meaning no, no routing involved, um, that only had terminal servers on it. And so we use different things. I, I'm actually going to hold this one up. This one's... Uh, one of my favorites, this is from a company called Open Gear. This one's a little interesting. This one has a LTE modem built in. And I've been using those in remote locations where if our prime, say our microwave goes down, um, the microwave link, I would fail over to the LTE link so they can always get access so I could go and restart things and so forth. Uh, Open Gear is was actually a sponsor for the um, Aloha Cabled Observatory and was one of the pieces of equipment that got shredded when our glass camera dome let go uh, recently and imploded three miles down. So obviously I'm going to have to put something else there. So the idea is it has a whole series of RJ45s and it allows me to go and put little dongles on them. So here, let's, let's show one. This is a typical dongle. This one happens to be a no modem so that I can run it straight into a, a typical piece of gear. And by just changing out the dongles, I can have it either pretend it's a modem or pretend it's a PC. Uh, change between gender and so forth so that I can hook it up to lots of different types of equipment. Um, the cool thing about this type of arrangement is that it allows a single port, an RJ45, to be able to connect it to all kinds of things because little things like, say, for instance, the, the nine-pin serial connector on the back of a lot of UPSs, if you plug a standard serial into that, say a serial cable from a PC, um, nine times out of 10, it'll actually cause the UPS to shut down because they're looking at control pins. So if the pin is live, UPS is up, if the pin goes down, it shuts down because it says I'm out of power. Anyway, <clears throat> the whole idea is we're, we're, we're trying to get into things. And I mentioned the slammer worm. Well, when slammer hit on the interrupt, um, show it was actually during the show and all of a sudden because slammer was sucking up all the bandwidth on the show network um, people couldn't do their demos they couldn't get out to the internet um, you could actually almost hear it as it went through the show floor all those yells and screams because we had so much gear that was sitting there we were able to go and characterize slammer very very quickly and in under 10 minutes still get in so here's something a lot of people don't under, don't know that serial console port the, on the front of your ethernet switches and your routers because it's serial it uses a hardware interrupt on the CPU of the switch so the serial console always takes well anyone that I've ever seen 
takes priority over inbound. So if you're trying to Telnet in or SSH in or web into a typical switch and you've got a denial of service attack going against you, um, there's a really good chance your switch is going to just sit there and act dumb because it's desperately trying to keep up. But if you go in through the serial port, because it's interrupt driven, it takes a priority over in band and allows you to get in. So some of the things that I'll do is like this doodad, this is called an air console, uh, happens to be fairly heavy because there's a significant battery in there. I can either go in wired ethernet or Wi-Fi. It can actually become its own uh, Wi-Fi access point. So it's standalone. And so I can plug this in and say in a telco closet and say, for instance, the telco closet just happens to be on a manufacturing floor and it's really, really loud. Say it's right next to a, a machine tool. So for safety's sake, I would rather not sit right next to it. So I can plug it in and wander off someplace else, work on it in a safer location where I don't have to wear earmuffs and keep going. Now, that's cool, but this is a device that um, has kind of fallen out of favor. Um, more and more switches and routers aren't using serial ports. They're using USB ports, uh, which is all well and good. But this guy has an RJ45 on it, and I could actually plug it right into the RJ45 on a switch or a router um, the setup for Cisco pinouts. And on the back of this guy, it's got a nine volt transistor battery um, plug so that it could stay bonded or paired to my PC with Bluetooth. And I can move it around from switch to switch to switch and do the initial configs. Because even though a lot of devices have web interfaces, um, you still have to use a initial config to give it an IP address, a net mask, a gateway, DNS, and so forth. You know, some basic networking gear, and then you can SSH in or Telnet in or web in. Um, <clears throat> one of the cool things about this um, was this was long, long before Kickstarter. A gentleman that actually lives in Florida, actually um, not far from here, um, I can't remember his name now. Anyway, um, I did an article on these types of serial, uh, Bluetooth serial dongles for InfoWorld magazine a long, long time ago. And they fell out of favor, you know, less and less. But now with the Internet of Things going on, um, lots of things need to start happening, need to be used serial to configure them. So if you are playing around with, say, something like... Um, IEEE 1588, uh, which is precision time, you're probably using an industrial switch. Those industrial switches normally must be configured through a serial interface. So I am predicting that as time goes on and IoT gets more and more popular, and we're going to start seeing it more and more, um, we'll probably start seeing the need for these things again. And so this comes as a thank you from uh, one of our viewers. They're starting to ask me questions about this, and um, there are still um, Bluetooth serial dongles being made. Um, they're just more expensive. The uh, my favorite from Blue Console, this this guy here, um, wasn't very expensive. Was, I think it was like sixty five dollars. Um, the newer ones are quite a bit more expensive, closer into two hundred range. But um, Bluetooth serial dongles, I predict dict are going to start coming back that happens to be my second favorite one unfortunately uh, grid connect dropped their uh, firefly version which used two triple a batteries which is a great thing i was um you know when you have it and you don't have to keep restarting the bluetooth you can move from rack to rack to rack to do initial configs or reconfigs so in the case of like for instance um interop we were able to get in, put in the ACL rules, and defeat Slammer, get bandwidth back so we could go upstream into the routers from our ISP and then start going backwards and putting in more and more ACLs until the interrupt net was fully functional. So out-of-band management is one of those interesting 
unsung heroes of the, of the network that allows you to do all kinds of different things and still get access to your gear even during a denial of service attack. Anyway, end rant. <laughs> Thank you, Cheever. That was fantastic. And I, these little devices, are, are they are they affordable? Like when you're starting to build out your network, how, like how affordable are they? Okay, so right now the Air Connect is probably one of the more popular ones. You can get an Air Console or Air Connect um, for under 200 bucks. Wow. Interestingly enough, um, one of the things that the viewer mentioned when I sent them to the Air Console people was if you're willing to buy a 20 pack, they drop down into like the $130 each range. So that's kind of a nice quantity discount. Very nice. Very nice. Cool. Anything else, Curtis? You have anything for uh, out of band management? He's gearing up. No, uh, Brian handled it uh, really well. I would say that one of the issues that, that I'm paying attention to these days is resilience. Yeah. And the thing that Brian brings up about out-of-band management being a key ingredient in resilience in the face of unexpected activity uh, against the network is very true. The, the nice thing is that out-of-band management allows a separately controllable way uh, to uh, to work with your infrastructure. And there is rarely a time when a separate path to control is a bad thing. So, uh, you know, Brian has some, some great uh, instances in which this turned out to be true. Uh, but for me, this out-of-band management falls into the category of best practice uh, for a resilient organization.